about what the loftier people would refer to as the nativity of Christ, what you could simply call the birthday of Christ, what we're accustomed to calling Ganna, which comes from the Greek, which means Lidat, or birth. Christo Ganna, for them, is Christmas, is our Lidat of Christos, or as we say, Amen, amen. Thank God for allowing us to commemorate and celebrate the birth of His beloved and only begotten Son, or His one-of-a-kind Son, Jesus Christ. So, I want to tell you a few points before I get into reading from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1. I'd have loved to read from the Gospel according to Mark because we seem to always remember in September that we're in Zamana Marcos, but after September, or Mascaram, we usually forget. We are in Zamana Marcos, so thank God for Zamana Marcos as well, or the era of Mark. And I can't read from a nativity scene from the Gospel according to Mark because there is no nativity scene in there. There is no birth of Jesus there. It's an action-packed thriller that goes straight into the story of John the Baptist and into the miracles of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Matthew is not a bad backup, and so we're going into Matthew. But before I get there, one thing we have to understand is that sometimes uh, we as more contemporary Christians like to look back at the past in a negative way. The truth of the matter is that not everything in the past is to be worshipped, and not everything in the present is. We should take that which is good from the past and incorporate it in the present, take that which is good from the present and incorporate it together, making sure we are able to get all the little bullshads of wisdom across the ages so that we can grow holier and more perfect on a daily basis. And I say that to say that you will not understand the Newer Testament if you are not intimately familiar with the Older Testament. And we see that from page one, from Matthew chapter one, which is the very first page of the Newer Testament, we see that we have to get to know the Older Testament. And in fact, the 27 books of the Newer Testament did not come in one nice bound book until hundreds of years of Christianity passing. If anything, whatever scrolls, whether it be a scroll of Isaiah, a scroll of the Book of the Twelve, like Micah and Nahum and Zephaniah, whatever it may be, they would grab the Old Testament and they would preach Christ's birth, Christ's crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, sitting at the right hand of His Father, and His coming again to judge all those who've ever lived and all those who've ever died through those scriptures. So for us, all of the Holy Scriptures are holy, old and new. And fundamentally here in Matthew chapter 1, a concept that you can understand even if you're not as familiar with the Older Testament, is that the gospel or the good news is ridiculing or putting down the idea of tribalism. It totally gets rid of it. And it does this in a special way that we'll address. But I want to give you two examples of that in a contemporary context that had me laughing at home. And I hope you laugh as well. Because in Psalm 2, we find out that he who is enthroned in heaven, or he who sits in heaven, laughs. So, the first example that I found very funny is that there were a number of uh, rising white nationalists in this past year, past two years, and a number of them have taken DNA tests, things like Ancestry.com and 23andMe.com, and they're not paying me either. But they take these tests, and what's so funny is that even though they think they're going to be the purest European ever, they always find that like everyone here on Earth, everyone is mixed, and they found out they're not quite as pure as they thought they were. A standstill maybe amongst the younger folks than amongst the older folks in uh, black American culture is Snoop Dogg. Would you believe me if I told you he went on George or Jorge Lopez's show and he did a DNA test and him, which because of whatever his attitude or whatever, you think he's more black, is ethnically only 72% black, right? So that's over 20% not. It just shows you that Whatever ideas or perceptions we have of purity and tribalism, 
if they're based on anything, they're based on nonsense, on stilts, they're based on nothing, it's not even based on evidence. So that even if it was the case that tribalism was a good idea, the evidence was not there to support it. So that's all an introduction to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1. I'll read verses 1 to 21. May he make us worthy to hear his good news. The book of the origins of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac became the father of Jacob. Jacob became the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah became the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez became the father of Hezron. Hezron became the father of Ram. Ram became the father of Aminadab. Aminadab became the father of Nahashon. Nahashon became the father of Salmon. Salmon became the father of Boaz by Rahab. Obed became the father of uh, Boaz became the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed became the father of Jesse. Jesse became the father of King David. David became the, the father of Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon became the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam became the father of Abijah. Abijah became the father of Asa. Asa became the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat became the father of Jerome. Jerome became the father of Uzziah. Uzziah became the father of Jotham. Jotham became the father of Ahaz. Ahaz became the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah became the father of Manasseh. Manasseh became the father of Ammon. Ammon became the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Sheolfiel. Sheolfiel became the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel became the father of Abiud. Abiud became the father of Eliakim. Eliakim became the father of Azor. Azor became the father of Sadduk. Sadduk became the father of Akim. Akim became the father of Eliud. Eliud became the father of Eleazar. Eleazar became the father of Maphon. Maphon became the father of Jacob. Jacob became the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the exile to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the exile to Babylon until the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ happened like this. After his mother Mary was promised in marriage to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her betrothed, who was a righteous man, did not want to make her a public spectacle, and so intended to put her away quietly. But as he was thinking about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, home, for what is conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall give him the name Jesus, God saves, because he will be the one to save his people from their sins. That was an extraordinarily long passage. It's usually when people say they're going to read the entire Bible that they flip right past that page because they don't want to hear so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so. Nobody wants to hear that. But it is particularly those moments that we want to flip the page of the Bible that are, is cause for us to pay attention more. Because perhaps if we're page flippers in the Bible instead of people who try to read the Bible carefully and listen to it carefully, perhaps then we will be subject to tribalism that this passage is preaching against. There are three women and a man I'm going to highlight. There's no way I can highlight all of that and still respect your time and still start Kaddasi in some timely manner. So I want to talk to you about Rahab, about Ruth, about Bathsheba and David, and finally about Joseph, the betrothed of Mary. Rahab was a harlot. That's a difficult English word, but because there are a lot of young people in the audience, I'm not going to explain what that is. I'm just going to hope you know what that means. And you can go read the passage again in a heart if you want a second look at it. What's interesting about Rahab is that though she was a harlot, and though harlotry is looked down upon throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, here she is 
smack dab in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Ruth is a total outsider. She is the daughter-in-law of Naomi, and she has a whole book, four chapters, very short, you can go read it for homework. Uh, and she is a total outsider, a non-Jew. And so here again, the idea of purity is wiped away. Because if there's a harlot in the genealogy of God, if there's, a, if there's an outsider, a non-Jew, what sort of purity can we be looking for in ourselves? Finally, we have Bathsheba, who actually did not do anything wrong. And, and it's interesting, Saint Jerome, or Holy Jerome, an early father of the church said, none of the Kaddusanator, none of the holy women that are listed in this genealogy uh, are there because of great things they did. Rather, they're people who scripture would blame. They're people who scripture would look down upon. And it shows us that he who was in this lineage of sinners came to wipe away and be born for us to wipe away all the sins of everyone who's ever lived and who's ever died. So that's an incredible thing that Jerome has said. But Bathsheba was subject to power abuse. She's the unnamed wife of Uriah here in this passage, whom David had murdered so that he could get with her and eventually give birth to Solomon, who had his own troubles and his own woes. And finally, we get to Joseph, the betrothed, the righteous man, who is the actual person here whose lineage is being delineated. It all goes back to Joseph, and he's not even the biological father of Jesus, but he is the adopted father of Jesus Christ. And this reminds us that whether we be Jew or Gentile, all of us have been grafted, all of us have been connected, all of us have become adopted into the family and the household or the beta cell of God. And that is through his grace that we have become his children, we have become his heirs. And it's not so that we could do whatever we want, but it's so that, as we sang earlier, the atonement, the redemption, the ransom of the whole world was born today. To connect that to the last line that was read, that Jesus, or his name literally means God saves, is the one who will save their people from their sins. Salvation is a tricky thing, but it's not a one-time event. It's a lifelong process. It began with even the creation of the cosmos or of the world. Our salvation is in the past, present, and the future. It's in the past in that what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us, this labor of love on the cross, granted us something that we could have never gotten through our own effort. It's in the present in that every day we have to carry our own crosses, we have to try to deny ourselves and try to increasingly love one another, and not just those in this building, but those who are in the whole world, because he is the redemption or the beza of the whole world. And finally, it's in the future, because as this is called his advent, or his first coming. We always talk and preach about his second coming, which is when he's not going to come in some smelly cave. He's gonna come in glory. He's gonna come on clouds. He's gonna come with thousands and tens of thousands of angels to judge everyone who's ever lived. And so it's with a little trepidation, with a little bit of a quibble in our, our mouth, that we say, Lord, have mercy, and we hope that we do everything that he's told us to do, and that he has mercy on us, and that he invites us into his kingdom. He invites us into his holy city that is not built with human hands at all. Finally, I'm gonna leave you with some questions that I'm not gonna answer, but I want you to chew on for the rest of the night during Kaddase, when you go home, and enjoy the feast downstairs as well. And when you feast tomorrow, I want you to think about these questions to see if we are responding to the one who is saving us from our sins in a proper manner. If we're truly celebrating Christmas. How do we respond to being saved from our sins? What do we think of and how do we treat 
the harlots of our society. Forget a harlot, how do we treat earthly singers who then want to become mazamra or choir singers? How do we view people of other ethnic groups? Within Ethiopia, we all know it's a mess, meaning our own community. But even outside of that, how do we view Latinos? How do we view American blacks? How do we view American white people? Is it in a way of recognizing that they have the same redeemer as all of us? And finally, talking about the power abuse, God even died for power abusers. So have we ever prayed for the, what we see as reckless behavior in Hollywood? Have we ever prayed for our president? What's about the example? May God have you hear his word of life, as he, as he always say. So just a, a quick cap uh, summary and 